Good morning. I've never had to preach with my children in the first row. That may prove to be distracting. Take your Bibles once again and turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. This morning I'll be concluding a two-part series on the sobering short story recorded for us in verses 19 through 31. You'll remember that this story of the rich man and Lazarus is not history. Rather, it's an imaginary tale our Lord told to teach certain truths, truths about life, truths about death, and truths about life after death. This parable is one that we would all do well to ponder on. There's really nothing quite like it in the Bible. In a sense, it stands alone. Consider the fact that this is the only instance we read of what the inhabitants of hell are feeling and wishing. What we have before us is a window into the worst place in existence. No, it's not a pretty sight, but it is a profitable one. By meditating on such realities as death, judgment, heaven, and hell, we are reminded of what really matters. It's the remedy to the drowsiness that's so prevalent in churches today. From time to time, we need to be told we're going to die. We need to be told that we're going to go to one of two places. We need to be told that the choices we make in this life determine where and how we will spend the next. We need to be told that there are no second chances for those who die outside of Christ. I, for one, am thankful that the Holy Spirit so directed Luke to include this story in his account of the life of Christ. He's the only gospel author to have done so. Let me read it for us. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31 says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Let's pray. 
Father, we are thankful for your word this morning. However, we come to you recognizing our need for your Spirit's help. We need ears to hear. Even as believers, Father, our hearts can grow cold. We are so easily distracted by the responsibilities of this life. And so we ask that you would help us to focus in on what you would have us to learn this morning. Help us to learn these important truths that are presented to us in this parable. Father, we pray on behalf of any believers, unbelievers that are in our midst this morning, that you would so work within them that they will come to savingly believe in Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In my first sermon on this dreadful tell, I simply drew out six truths for us. Those truths were, number one, a good life is no sure sign of a right standing with God. Number two, a hard life is no sure sign of a wrong standing with God. Number three, death is the common lot of all who live. Number four, there is life after this life. Number five, the afterlife for an unbeliever is one of torment. And number six, the afterlife for a believer is one of comfort. That was part one in this morning's sermon, which is part two. I'm simply going to draw out six more truths from this tale. Needless to say, by the time I'm done, I'll have drawn out 12 truths from this dreadful, this terrible story. The first for this morning is, a moral life will not make for a better afterlife. A moral life will not make for a better afterlife. Notice what we do not read about the rich man. We do not read of the rich man living a life of sin. He is not portrayed here as being some great sinner. He's not characterized by gross immorality or drunkenness, although such a life would have been very easy for him to fall into. Just think back to the parable of the prodigal son. This man is not accused of anything that we would consider to be a major sin. He's not accused of being a murderer or a thief. No, this man was a moral man, and I don't think it would be too much to say that this man was a religious man. After all, this parable was directed to the religious leaders. Christ, in this story, was critiquing them. As one pastor put it, the rich man was not sent to hell because he was a secular, irreligious Jew. Like the Pharisees, he was outwardly religious by the standards of the day, so much so that he thought of his riches as a reward from God. He and his brothers were familiar with Moses and the prophets, and he even understood that they needed to repent so that they would not also come to this place of torment where he found himself. His knowledge that they needed to repent also presupposes a belief in sin, the law, and God as lawgiver. While all sin damns the unredeemed to hell, there is nothing to suggest that he was guilty of any especially heinous sins. Like the Jews, he was religious and well-respected, and that argues for the fact that he was not in hell because he was guilty of such sins, end quote. This man was moral. This man was religious. He was a Bible student of sorts. And yet, he did not make it to heaven. It all did nothing for him. All the sins he abstained from in life did not earn him a single drop of water to cool his tongue. What a mistake this man made. I'm sure that he comforted himself with his morality and religiosity. If you were to ask this man if he thought he was going to heaven, he would have answered, heaven. And if you were to go on to ask this man if he, why he thought he was going to heaven, he would have told you, because I'm a good person. I go to church. I read my Bible. I've been faithful to my wife. 
No doubt this man was at a complete loss for words when he found himself condemned to hell. I see him as one of those who will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles only to hear him say in return, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, you must know that a moral life will not make for a better afterlife. There's a way to hell that goes through the town of morality. There is a way to hell that even goes through the church. You must know there is absolutely nothing you can do in this life. There is no sin you can abstain from that will keep you from going to hell or that will ensure that you will go to heaven. You can in no way merit a righteousness that pleases God. It is an impossibility. The absolute best you can do is to him no better than a filthy garment. That's what Isaiah tells us. Perhaps you're wondering why I'm telling this to church people. The answer is, it's because church people are exactly the ones who need to hear it. The original audience of this parable was church people. Jesus did not say these things to obvious sinners. He did not say them to the atheists in his days. He he said them to people a lot like you and me. We must make sure we are not resting in our, our moral decency or our integrity, our purity, or chastity, our ethicality, or our piety. We must rest only in the perfect righteousness of Christ. We must believe that he fulfilled the law on our behalf and that he was punished for all the times that we will ever break it. That is the only way to get to heaven. That is the only thing that makes for a better afterlife. Jesus in John chapter 14 verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father but through me. That's the first truth I wanted to draw out for us this morning. The second is no relation or affiliation in this life will make for a better afterlife. No relation or affiliation in this life will make for a better afterlife. Did you notice what the rich man calls Abraham? He calls him father. He does it not once, not twice, but three times. In verse 24, we read, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham. In verse 27, we read, and he said, then I beg you, Father. Last, we read in verse 30, but he said, no, Father Abraham. Not only did the rich man call Abraham father, but Abraham called the rich man child in verse 25. So what we have in this story is a child of Abraham in hell. This would have absolutely stunned the Lord's listeners. Remember to whom he was speaking, the Pharisees. These were men who believed they would go to heaven simply because of their heritage. They were Jews. They were God's chosen people. They were his elect nation. Jews went to heaven as long as they were not tax collectors, irreligious, or gross sinners. Gentiles went to hell. That's how it worked. At least that's how they thought it worked. This is why John the Baptist declared to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance And then he says, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. What the baptizer told them not to do is exactly what they did. In John chapter 8, we read that Christ, in so many words, says that they're children of Satan, children of the devil, and they respond to him by saying, Abraham is our father. 
This is what the Jews assured themselves with, with the fact that they were the ancestors of Abraham. That was their ticket to paradise. But here, Christ crushes that fatal dream. In so many words, he declares to them that the descendants of Abraham can and will be damned along with everyone else who does not accept him as their prophet, priest, and king. Notice that the rich man's ancestry does absolutely nothing for him. It does not secure for him any special privileges whatsoever. It does not gain for him the smallest mercy from God. It didn't matter who his family was, there are no special favors in hell. We learn from this that no relation or affiliation in this life will make for a better afterlife. And in this sense, it doesn't matter who your parents were or are, it doesn't matter who your spouse is, it doesn't matter what denomination you are a member of. None of those things will help you get to heaven. None of those things will guard you from going to hell. Quite honestly, hell is teeming with people who have very close ties with people in heaven. Consider that even if a person were the physical brother or sister of Christ himself, that would not ensure he would enter the gates of heaven. Even if Christ was your actual brother. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, find verses 46 through 50. Verse 46 of Matthew chapter 12 says, while he was still speaking to the crowds, Behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside, seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Isn't that something? If you were a physical relative of the Lord, but didn't submit to him as Lord, he would not recognize you as his family. And when you died and appeared before him, he would dismiss you as someone he never knew. Now, if such a close connection as that couldn't help you out, don't count on any other connection to do so. We must know Christ as our Lord and our Savior, or else we will be just like this rich man, men and women with worthless connections. It was J.C. Ryle who said, let it be a settled principle with us that saving religion is a personal thing. It is a business between each man's soul and Christ. It will not profit us nothing at the last day to have belonged to the church of Luther or Calvin or Cranmer or Knox or Owen or Wesley or Whitfield. Had we the faith of these holy men, did we believe as they believed? and strive to live as they lived, and to follow Christ as they followed him. These will be the only points on which our salvation turn. It will save, he concludes, no man to have had Abraham's blood in his veins if he did not possess Abraham's faith and do Abraham's works. The third truth I would draw out for us this morning is that this life is the closest an unbeliever will get to heaven and a believer to hell. This life is the closest an unbeliever will get to heaven and a believer to hell. In response to the rich man's first request, we read in verse 25 that Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. 
but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. What we should understand from this verse is that the rich man chose earth to be his heaven. That was his fatal flaw or his fatal mistake. He chose earth to be his heaven. He lived his best life now. He knew nothing of taking up his cross and following after Christ. He knew nothing of losing his life for Christ's sake. His life was one of ease because he lived it for himself. He had every comfort that life could afford. He had every luxury that money could buy. But the question we must ask this morning is, at what cost? At what cost? What did it cost this man to have it so good in the here and now? We know it cost him his never dying soul. The rich man chose to smile now and cry forever. Think about that for a moment. This man chose a few years of living in high fashion over an eternity of living in heavenly fellowship. What we read of in verse 19 would be the closest this man would ever get to heaven. That was it. He had his fun. Now it was all over. Never again would he experience anything good. The inhabitants of hell experience nothing good. Not even something as small and insignificant as a drop of water. And what can we say to that? I hope he enjoyed it. I hope it was worth it. We know it wasn't. This man was another Esau who, who sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. To say that this rich man received a raw deal would be a great understatement. It's because of, of this truth that the English minister Thomas Manton said, what little reason the people of God have to envy wicked men on account of their portion. We should rather pity them. Alas, this is all they get. They have this and no more. This and everlasting destruction at the back of it. Worldly wealth and prosperity is not of so much worth and excellency as many think. Friends, nothing is as valuable as our souls. This is why the Lord rhetorically asks, for what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? The answer is nothing. It profits him nothing. It's a bad deal. Our, our souls are worth more than 10,000 worlds. I have to tell you that if you're an unbeliever this morning, this is the best it's going to get for you, whether your life's a good one or a hard one. This is it. This is your heaven. Death will be the end of all your happiness. And what you will pay for this briefest of moments on earth is everlasting torment. To put it simply, you're, you're being swindled out of your soul because of your love for self and sin. May God help you to see this even this morning so that you may turn to Christ in faith and so receive eternal life. This life is the closest an unbeliever will get to heaven. That's the first half of this third truth. The second half, the other half, is that this life is the closest a believer will get to hell. Although Lazarus' life on earth was hell, the truth is it was not as bad as hell, not even close. Consider that the rich man in hell would have loved to be in Lazarus' earthly condition. Have you ever thought about that? If the rich man were presented with the option of either staying in hell or becoming a beggar like Lazarus was, he would have chose the latter in a heartbeat. Whatever circumstances we find ourselves in this morning, the truth is there are multitudes in hell who would give anything to trade places with us. Although severe suffering can take place here on earth, and I don't want to discount that, it is nothing compared to the suffering of those in hell. As believers, this should, this should be so very comforting and encouraging. We will never get what we truly deserve. 
we will never get justice in the sense that we will never be judged for our sins. We will never <clears throat> experience divine wrath. Like Lazarus, this is as bad as it gets. This is the worst of it. it it's only up from here. Our miseries are but for a moment. What did the Apostle Paul say? He said, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. While the death of unbelievers will be the end of their happiness, the death of believers will be the beginning of theirs. The Puritan Thomas Watson said, we spend our years with sighing. It is a valley of tears, but death is the funeral of all our sorrows. I encourage all of you who are facing various kinds of trials, take heart. Your afflictions are still fewer than your sins. You deserve far worse. But Christ has propitiated the wrath of God that abided on you. Now, because of him, your present sufferings are the worst of it. And what's more, they are numbered. One day, all your suffering will come to an end, and you will never experience a single hardship again. If you are a believer in Christ this morning, you are in an infinitely better position than the wealthiest, healthiest unbeliever. To be a believing beggar is much to be preferred than an unbelieving king. To quote Ryle once more, an unconverted king may glitter like a butterfly in the sun for a little season and be admired by, ignorant, by an ignorant world, but his latter end is darkness and misery forever. On the other hand, a converted beggar may crawl through the world like a crushed worm and be despised by everyone who sees him, but his latter end is a glorious resurrection and a blessed eternity with Christ. So far, I've drawn out three truths from this dreadful tale. Number one, a moral life will not make for a better afterlife. Number two, no relation or affiliation in this life will make for a better afterlife. Number three, this life is the closest an unbeliever will get to heaven and a believer to hell. This brings us to the fourth truth. This life is the time for gospel ministry. This life is the time for gospel ministry. I don't want to spend too much time on this point, but I also don't want to go on without saying anything. You know how that is, right? Once again, verses 25 and 26 say, But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. Don't you find it interesting that our Savior in this story has Abraham say that there are those in heaven who wish to go over from there to hell? I find that very interesting. Who being in heaven, would ever wish to leave such a wonderful place, and not just to go back to earth, but to hell. Consider that Christ could have just said, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that none may cross over from there to us. That would have made sense. So why did Christ say what he did? Will some people in heaven wish to go to hell? I think the obvious answer is no. Everyone in heaven will be happy to be there. 
And then again, why did Christ say this? Why would anyone ever want to leave paradise to go to the place of punishment? And, and the best reason that I can think of is because of some sort of desire to minister to souls that are in misery. But the point is, the point is, they will not be able to. They will not be able to. And so I must ask you several questions. Do, do you realize we will not always be able to preach the gospel to poor lost sinners? One thing we will not be able to do in heaven is share the good news about Jesus Christ. One day, the work of evangelism will be done. This, of course, is not to say that we'll be bored in heaven or that there will be nothing to do. Our love for Christ and for his glory will have plenty of outlets there. But the fact still remains that the privilege of pointing those who are perishing to Christ will have passed away along with the possibility of storing up treasures in heaven by doing so. Jesus in John chapter 9 verse 4 tells us that we must work the works of him who sent me, that is the Father, as long as it is day for night is coming when no man can work. The time of laboring for the Lord is now. Now is the time to invest the talents our master has entrusted to us. A person can no longer do good to the unbelieving world when he or she is under the ground. That's the teaching of the New Testament, and it's very, very clear. We are not to waste the opportunity we have to do good to our fellow man and bring glory to God while on earth. And to do so is a great tragedy. To do so is to lose out on future reward. This truth is what made Charles Spurgeon say to his congregation, go and labor with all your might. Remember, you can only do that in this life. For when the gates are shut, you are shut in for your reward, and all the world is shut out from your efforts. How earnest this ought to make the people of God to work while it is called today. If this is our only time for doing good, let us do good while we can. Let us be lukewarm no longer. If God makes us lights in the world, let us spend ourselves as a candle does, which consumes itself by shining. There's a word here for unbelievers as well. You may be annoyed by conversations about the gospel with your friends, with your family members. You may be annoyed by my sermon this morning or others like it. But you ought to know that one day, no one will be able or even have any good news to share with you. Just as this life is the only opportunity believers have to preach the gospel, this life is the only opportunity for you to hear the gospel and to respond to it by believing in Christ. For both believers and unbelievers, it is now or never. And before I move on to the next point, I would just direct you to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Don't turn there now, but later. It says, he who wins souls is wise, or he who is wise wins souls. That means we are fools if we don't make soul winning our business. This life is the time for gospel ministry. The fifth truth I would draw out for us is that Scripture is sufficient to produce spiritual life. Scripture is sufficient to to produce spiritual life. I'll do my best to adequately address this next point. It's a very important truth, but it really deserves its own sermon. Verses 27 through 29 say, And he, that is the rich man, said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, Lazarus, for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. 
These verses are remarkable. In the first place, notice the rich man's indirect accusation. In so many words, what the rich man is saying is, I would have repented and believed if I had evidence. The only reason I am here in hell is because I was not presented with sufficient proof. Do you see that? The rich man's request betrays a very low view of Scripture and a very high view of man. It paints the Bible as insufficient and man as simply ignorant. Man is willing to believe as long as he is given reasonable evidence for doing so. That, that's the implication here. Basically, the rich man is requesting that Abraham do for his brothers what would have presumably prevented himself from being damned. Give them what wasn't given to me. I wasn't given a fighting chance, so please give them one. But notice in the second place that such an excuse is disregarded by Abraham. We are told, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What we must learn from these words is, is that Scripture is sufficient to produce spiritual life. Nothing else is needed, and we should expect nothing else to be granted. Friends, the Bible tells us all that is necessary to be saved. Not only that, but it presents to us the greatest arguments to be saved. It gives us evidence after evidence of its own veracity. In other words, it's self-evidencing. It does for itself more than any person who rose from the dead could do. And perhaps you're wondering, what are the evidences it gives? The evidence Scripture gives of its divine origin are the glorious truths it reveals, the events it foretells, the standard it holds forth, and the change it produces in countless people, just to name a few. The Bible is evidently a supernatural book. So if you don't turn from your sins and trust in Christ to be your substitute because of the Bible, you never will. That's what Christ is teaching in this story. You never will. The fact that you do not recognize the supernatural characteristics of this book is proof that you will not believe even if other supernatural evidences were given to you. Just as you explain the Bible away, you would explain away any other supernatural phenomenon. This is a truth that both unbelievers and believers need to take to heart. Too many churches today try to draw sinners to Christ by every means except the Word of God. In an attempt to increase numbers, many churches have become just like the world. Oftentimes, churches aren't so much a place of worship, just another place of worldly entertainment. It's almost as if Christian leaders today have the same view of Scripture as the rich man in our story. It's insufficient. It's not enough. Something else must be presented, something something exciting, something dramatic. What we need today are more men like the Apostle Paul who said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the, not a, power of God for salvation to everyone, not some, not a few, but to everyone who believes. Whoever is saved, everyone who has been saved, has been saved because of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power is in the word, it's not in anything else. Before moving on, I'd have you uh, remember the story of the young man named Eutychus. I would encourage you all to read it sometime this week. It can be found in Acts chapter 20. Luke tells us that one night Paul was waxing eloquent and Eutychus, having fallen asleep on the windowsill, fell out and was picked up dead. We are then told that Paul went down to where his body lay and and embraced him, and he came back to life. Now, isn't it telling that when they got back into the house, Eutychus didn't take over preaching? 
The thought never seems to have struck a single person. We are told that Paul went on preaching. No one seems to have cared about Eutychus's experience at all. No one asked about what he had seen, about what he had heard. And I would submit to you, that is because Eutychus had nothing more to say or more important to say than what Paul had because Paul was already teaching the Word of God. It is sufficient. The final truth I would draw out for us this morning closely follows the fifth. It is this. Signs are insufficient to produce spiritual life. Signs are insufficient to produce spiritual life. Verse 30 and 31 say, But he, the rich man, said, No, he's arguing at this point. No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. What was implied in verses 27 through 29 is clearly stated here. Despite what the rich man thought, his brothers would not repent even if they came face to face with a formerly dead man. This is one of the most powerful pictures of the hardness of sinners' hearts. Matthew Poole wrote, There is not possibly in all the book of God a text that more speaks of the desperate hardness of a sinner's heart than this. He says, if it were possible that unbelieving men and women should see one come out of the bottomless pit, tearing his hair and wringing his hands and gnashing his teeth and bewailing his misery and begging of them to be wise by his example telling them for what sins he is made so miserable, and with tears and highest expressions of passion, beseeching them that while they have time, they would leave off their courses, uh, acquaint themselves with God, and be at peace, and thereby good might come unto them, he says they would not yet believe nor repent, nor would this have any further effect upon them than a little passion, till they could get the din, that is, the annoying noise, out of their ears. Did you know that in a way the rich man's request was answered? There was a man named Lazarus who was rose from the dead, that was raised from the dead. John chapter 11. And guess what? Abraham was absolutely right. It did not persuade everyone who saw him to repent and believe. In fact, John tells us, as Monty has preached several weeks ago, that the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death, the brother of Mary and Martha, because he was an evidence of the deity of Christ. Far from going where the evidence leads, they wanted to get rid of it altogether. That is the unbeliever. They do not believe for lack of evidence, but because they don't want to, because they hate God. And friends, if you're, if you're waiting for a sign to believe in God, you're waiting in vain. And even if a sign were to occur, it would not convince you. You would not be converted like you think you would be. The reason you don't believe in God is because you don't want to believe in God. It's a matter of the will. Your will is in bondage to sin. You don't follow God because you love your sin too much. You will not believe because you would not believe. Again, if the scriptures do not convince and convert you, nothing will. You're without hope. I want you to listen very closely to what I'm about to say. If you don't believe in Christ because of the testimony of Scripture, you would not believe even if he were to come down from heaven and stand before you this morning. If he were to come down from heaven and stand before you this morning, wrapped in flesh, again, standing before your eyes, it would not be enough to convert you. 
And I know that because that is what the Scripture says. Furthermore, that is what we see throughout the Gospels. In all four Gospel accounts, we see individuals refusing to trust in Christ despite the fact that they could see Him and touch Him and hear Him. And you would do exactly the same thing. In order for you to believe, a divine miracle needs to take place within you. God must give you the faith which with you must trust in Christ, and this work is only done by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. And that means what you want to do is to sit under the preaching of God's Word as much as you possibly can, all the while asking Him to give you ears to hear. Read the Bible, and for as long as it takes, beg God to be gracious to you. Plead with Him to confirm its contents as faithful and true. Ask Him to help you close with Christ, that is, to come to terms with Him. And if you do so sincerely, I have no doubt that He will graciously answer your prayer. This morning, I've drawn out six truths for us to seriously consider. I pray that you do consider a moral life will not make for a better afterlife. Consider that no relation or affiliation in this life will make for a better afterlife. Consider that this life is the closest an unbeliever will get to heaven and a believer to hell. Consider that this life is the time for gospel ministry. Consider that scripture is sufficient to produce spiritual life and that signs are insufficient to produce it. These truths should have a profound impact on believers and unbelievers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, we do not deny that there are hard sayings contained in it. We do not deny that Christ said many hard sayings, many difficult sayings. And not because they're so complex, but because they're just so heavy. I do pray, though, that our response would not be to run from you, but to run to you. Help us to realize that uh, you are not the problem. We're the problem, and you're the one that fixes the problem of our sin. You've done so by providing Christ, your your only begotten Son, to die in the place of sinners, to die in the place of all who uh, would believe in Him, to have done so for them. Father, even as believers, such, such a message has many applications for us. Help us to always rely on Your Word to to minister to each other, to minister to the world around us. Help us not to seek other means by which to, to win souls. You've given us the means. Help us to be comforted with the fact that we are dealing with the very worst that we'll ever have to deal with, that it's only up from here. Keep that hope at the forefront of our minds, a stamp our eternal hope on our eyeballs, We thank you so much for this morning and for one another, the fellowship that we have and that we will enjoy even today. In Christ's name I pray, amen.